Be sure this is recording. Hello, hello. Numbers are running, meters are metering. Fantastic. So, hello, Tim from CSCI Podcast here again, and I'm here today with Jonathan Noyce, bass player extraordinaire. So, um, uh, oh, I suppose, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself, John? Just a brief, I'm John, here's me. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to uh, for you to listen to me. <laughs> um, my name's Jonathan Noyce. I'm, I'm a musician. Uh, I grew up in a musical family. My father was a cathedral organist um um but we also had some beatles records so that kind of started me off and then i like the drums i still like the drums but i couldn't play the drums because mum and dad lived in a really old house so i settled on piano and guitar and bass and synthesizers and tape recorders and things and um i spent most of my life playing bass guitar for people uh with some production as well um, I'm currently kind of going back to my original self, which is um, making music um, with synthesizers and bits and pieces. Um, I trained classically, so I've got a couple of strings to my bow. It's quite useful. I find that very useful, and um, which has enabled me to do all sorts of interesting things that I never thought I was going to do, like being progressive rock bands and um, and not but I've kind of wound up being a bit of a specialist in working with amongst electronic music. So balancing playing and electronic stuff is an interesting pastime, uh, which I really enjoy. So, yeah, um, maybe you'll learn a bit more about me in the next couple of hours or whatever it is. <laughs> so, right. Uh, as you say, you started off playing drums and piano and you've ended up as you say freshly playing bass yeah um yeah how, how did you work your way up so you started at home and then you've ended up here i know you've been through positions with a couple of bands yeah it was there a clear progression that went through or was it all a bit haphazard well it ended up being quite clear actually i think sort of the first few years when i was in my teens playing and um discovering music and discovering what i liked uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that was kind of fairly muggy, but actually that's kind of formed me because it means that I've got a kind of a wider view of the world uh, sonically. The studying, I guess, you know, back then, the only way for me to study music was to study classically, formally, which uh, in retrospect has actually has been really, really good for me because it's giving me um, a language and it's given me the ability to read and write in the language so that's uh interesting about communication with others uh, yes communication uh, it's, it enables communicating with others it enables me to read things that people have written recently or hundreds of years ago um but also in writing things down you can learn a lot about music um you can see the way that uh, patterns emerge um so that's that's it's been very very helpful for me once I, I, yeah, I studied percussion, I studied piano, I studied double bass. Um, I ended up playing in youth orchestras and um, I wound up at the Royal Academy of Music. Right. And uh, graduated from there in 94 um, while I was in London. Yeah, so, I mean, it was all fairly, yeah, I, I was in London and it was great. I was playing with my mates and yeah. um, started to, work professionally and work in studios. So what was the first sort of big important step you said you were taking? Most important step? Well, probably the going to... The first one. The, well, uh, the first well, thing. What, so, back in the day. Yeah, I know for example, you were, uh, take that. Oh, yeah. You did Jethro Tull. Well, I guess take that was the thing that... I mean, it's always good to have something that people know, yeah. irrespective of what it is. And yeah. I played on some records by Take That and uh, much to my delight and surprise they were number one hits so that was kind of quite fun um, it, and doing that registered some kind of success with lots of people and still today if, um, if people know about the things that you do then it's um, it, it, it's a kind of a tick of approval yeah. so those things were helpful yeah that was good and then I came out of college and pretty much joined Jethro Tull within a few uh, within the year I was I was with them that just so 
happened that David Pegg, their bass player, had left. So, and I was there exactly at the same time. Right place, right time. Yeah. So that was a that was a big step for me to uh, to join them, and uh, and and I did that for twelve years. Yeah. So uh, that took up a lot of time, but in that in itself is you know, it had to, it took me on kind of different journeys. Yeah. Uh, met lots of people. Met Gary Moore. Um, struck up a friendship with Gary. Had a had a band with him that was really great. Um, and uh, played with the Divine Comedy, mm-hmm. which was kind of slightly related. Which was kind of like was like a breath of fresh air. Yeah. Actually, um, as much as I love the music of Jethro Tull, um, it was great to play <laughs> something which was concise <laughs> and uh, equally brilliantly but differently written. You yeah. know. Um, so uh, yeah, that was a uh, yeah, it was a, a, a good ride. And pretty much since then, uh, I, I left Tal, and within a few years, I met uh, guys at the Banquet Archive, and uh, I've spent a good amount of time exploring the outer extremities of bass culture with them. Ever since, <laughs> yes. I've I've seen uh, you quoted in in magazines or wherever in interviews saying that you play stealth bass. Yeah. Yeah. Would you yeah. care to explain that? <clears throat> yeah. Well, I guess it's sort of the, it, it's an, it, it's the concept of being kind of invisible. I, I think that, um, um, that's one of the great things about being a bass player. You can, to a certain extent, you can kind of stand at the back yeah. and, um, support the proceedings kind of musically, but, um, it gives you a certain kind of, uh, overview, but no, it's just the idea of uh, being felt right. uh, or sensed, and not necessarily kind of be really uh, in front, so to speak. Because I think that um, a question of playing—I yeah. I guess it's sort of playing more intellectually right. than with um, trying to kind of keep the ego in check. I see exactly what you mean. You know, less showy offy and more serving the song. Yeah, because I just—you know—I find that when people are showing off. I mean, unless you're a you know and a guitarist, guitarists are particularly good at showing off, um, which I'm not. Um, uh, yeah, it's just the, the things I like. Are, it, particularly when you listen to recorded music, it's obvious. If the, if the intent is wrong, mm-hmm. it tends to kind of sit in a, in a different way. If somebody's very aware about what they're doing because it wanted it to sound good or uh, be kind of super cool, then those sorts of things can I can I think can backfire a bit. So the idea of stealth is literally to be sort of to be felt or sensed, and not 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 necessarily heard. Yeah. So um, I know alongside your your music with bands that you've done a lot of soundtrack work for films. Mm. Um, would I can see how the the concept of stealth base would be maybe even more important in that? Yeah. Well. Yeah. That's interesting. That's kind of there's a whole different thing when it comes to working with picture. And uh, it's more text, even more textural than working on record, which yeah. is uh, which is sort of my expertise, if you like. I think is sort of with texture. So doing the film work is interesting because you have to be kind of more oblique, and you have to kind of come at things at more uh, like I studied at art school, which yeah. I didn't, you know. <laughs> cool. Well, we have a list of questions here compiled by our, our fellow podcasters. So uh, the next one on the list is, what's been your favourite project, favourite thing you've done musically, and why? Oh, that's tricky. Uh, there's been a few moments that have been really great. Um, recording with Archive, um, and uh, in one particular record we did, um, I've always had free range uh, yeah. to do something, and I've taken that challenge very seriously, and I love it because I like to, I like to travel to the outer edges of the galaxy, and um, look back at myself and wonder what the hell I was doing. But no, I think when you, it's a challenge to come up with something that is, uh, you know, su- surprises me. Yeah. Put it that way. And if I'm surprised by something or like something, then other people are going to be surprised. So uh, recording a, a record which. Um, in amongst synths and coming up with a, a dub line on a piece of music where you wouldn't necessarily expect it. Um, so those kind of recording moments are really cool. Um, I had a fantastic band with Gary Moore, which was just like uh, riding in, a, in an F1. You know, it was, it was an extraordinarily powerful beast. 
Um, but those are kind of two kind of things. But you know, I don't know. I've, I've done lots of. I, you know, I really enjoy what I do. You know, particularly memorable shows. Um, yeah, there was a show I did fairly recently with the Divine Comedy in 2017. We went over to Ireland, and we, um, Neil's from originally from the north, but he settled in the, in, the, in 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 the south. And um, he's a well, you know, he's he's a masterful writer. Yeah. Um, there's a piece of music that he wrote called Sunshine, which is about the troubles, right. and we played in Derry, right, and um, to a very quite a serious audience, very quiet, but uh, very attentive. And uh, we played Sunshine and came to the end of the piece, and you could have heard a, a, a pin drop. It was quite an extraordinary moment. Wow. So uh, those little things are kind of are memorable, but um, yeah, that's one of the most recent ones. Yeah. Well, that sounds amazing. I imagine that being really quite a powerful experience. Yeah. Being part of it. Yeah, it was actually. It was uh, extraordinary. It was, and it, you know, it was poignant and beautiful. And, um, you know, Neil is sort of the master of, of, of understatement. Yeah. And um, it was, yeah, it was, it was a beautiful thing. Mm. Yeah. And I bet there's been a, Plenty of tour bus moments, which she'll stay on. She'll stay on the tour bus. <laughs> yeah, lots of fun. Yeah. Nothing terribly naughty, but lots of fun. So, kind of the opposite question to that. Mm -hmm. You had a nightmare experience. Have I had nightmare experiences? <clears throat> yeah, I have. Um, my nightmare experiences. Well, I mean, there are sort of comedy nightmare experiences, right. and the comedy nightmare experiences involve people who for you know i mean there's one particular incidence of playing on a on a record a guy had sort of illusions of being kind of something kind of really great but he you know the guy wasn't unfortunately he was a nice fella yeah um so um the challenge in a situation like that well it's just an extension of making anything sound good was actually to kind of to make build the things around it that gave it some support yeah. and it actually turned out to a really good record oh, <clears throat> actually um so that was fun but yeah i have been in a few situations that haven't been uh, haven't been fun at all uh touring yeah. had a tour in south america with jethro tull that just ended up being one calamity after another and um involving fires on stage <clears throat> um broken uh, uh you know knee injuries yeah. um um people getting sick you know people got sick the drum tech jay nearly ended his life there you know right. got some bug and um don the drummer was having some experiences some very um serious side effects from taking larium which is a drug that they used to administer for anti-malarials right and um just before we went out there, I saw a documentary about Larry on the BBC, and um, he was taking it. I remember saying, asking what he took. He said, Larry, I said, yeah, I've just seen something about that. Anyhow, he had um, some, I mean, sounded like kind of borderline psychotic moments, couldn't sleep, horrible depression. Yeah. Um, that was a horrible tour. Yeah. It was really, really horrible. So, yeah, um, some very stressful <clears throat> Occasionally, very, very stressful situations, mm. which um, I realise that um, I'm quite good at dealing with those. Right. Not that they make them any easier, but um, <laughs> yeah, nothing. But I mean, thankfully, nothing life-threatening. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's good to take experiences like that, and if you can, try and learn something from them and, and grow as a person. Yeah, they do help you. Yeah, you have to kind of build. <clears throat> you have to get through it. Yeah. You have to get through it in a way which um, steers it out the other side, out yeah. the side, and um, yeah, when they're really, when things are really tough, yeah, you just got to kind of pull your socks up, and yeah, you do learn a lot from it. Yeah, actually, cool. I was just, yeah, I was just thinking about that, and um, well, I know from experience, as I'm sure you do as well, like uh, having good sleep hygiene, if you like. Yeah, Whereas when you're when you're touring and when you work, even if you're in the studio and you're working, it's stressful, long days when you're on tour doing stuff. Um, do you, while you're out doing things like that in studio sessions or on tour, do you make time to look after that side of yourself? Yeah, I try. Yeah. <clears throat> it's difficult when you're on tour because things are later and I've learnt that um, <clears throat> I, I function better if I go to bed early. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how, like going to bed at five in the morning, having my house kept, it doesn't work yeah. for me. Right. So 
<clears throat> you have to kind of sh- you have to sort of uh, make allowances on tour. But I try and you know I try and walk. I try and get out for a couple of hours every day, um, which is which is always good. But um, yeah, I mean it's a question of kind of when you can sleep. And my life tends to be a bit black and white. I'm in a <clears throat> I'm having a moment where I'm working more during the day, so I've, I, I can go to bed at night. You know, mm-hmm. but when I'm gigging a lot things will change and um, things have to flip but it's making sure that when you've got the time just to kind of to um, to get some sleep because it's the way the only way that your brain gets a chance to repair itself well, exactly. yeah. yeah yeah there's um, a, a growing awareness of mental health and <clears throat> dealing with that just in, in the yeah. world at large yeah, also, yeah particularly inside of the creative industries yes I think that's a it can be nothing but healthy. No, absolutely not. Because I think you know, there's obviously people have a. It's 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 not a new problem, but the last couple of years since the pandemic, it's has um, has underlined things. That's for sure. But uh, yeah, we all need to kind of take care of ourselves, Definitely. and um, get outside and smell the flowers. <laughs> I think. <laughs> <Secret>. <laughs> yeah, think yeah, listen the... to the birds. <laughs> cool. All right, we're going all deep there. So <laughs> coming back to these questions we have written here, which three people? have been most influential on you and your sort of career trajectory? <sighs> well, career trajectory. Um, well... And then musically as a second question. Yeah. Career trajectory. Well, I would say probably my first percussion teacher, Gerald Kirby, mm-hmm. um, who is a working, yeah, professional percussionist. Right. And has been for, for a long, long time. So I had an... Uh, I had a, a view into his world and what it meant to do what he did, yeah. does, which is, you know, playing in orchestras and such. So I got to hang out and meet some people there. Um, and then I guess kind of going to the, well, I mean, going to the Royal Academy of Music was a really big thing for me, but I would say that, okay, right. <laughs> Interesting. So, yeah, I would say... Andrew Livingston and Dave Lee, who produced the Take That stuff that I was involved with. Yeah. Dave, they were, at the time they were working together, because Dave is also, he's a very, very well known DJ. Yeah. Um, but he goes out under Dave Lee, but he has many monikers, including <laughs> Joey Negro. Right. So I got involved with Dave doing all the Joey Negro stuff, um, sort of 83, and that kind of. And we ended up working to take that together. So that was a really important thing for me. But actually, kind of later on, um, I had a meeting with, uh, I did some sessions with uh, Global Communication, right. who are a kind of seminal British electronic act, right. Mark Pritchard and Tom Middleton, um, who are entities with, you know, separately, but they did a, a couple of great records. So we had a week. So this is back in the, the you know the good old nineties when there was you know people had the kind of foresight to kind of all right let's just go and spend a week jamming let's see what comes yeah. out of it. So myself and Andy Gangadine went down and and um, yeah um, and yeah Andy's a huge influence on me I have to say um, amazing fellow entity. Um, so we went down to do these things. So it was a meeting of minds. It was yeah. there really was a question of right. Um, we were curious about working with these two dudes whose yeah. world was completely different musically from ours. But it was actually vice versa. Yeah. So there was this kind of, a, it was like a conference, you know, right. a summit yeah. of, um, well, of things. Keen to do exactly the same thing in the opposite direction. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, but still using the, but using the studio as a, as a, as a weapon, you know. <laughs> and, um, but we, we, had a, we got a, a couple of singles came out of that, but that was really important because that actually got, that got me back to thinking, that took me back to when I was fiddling around with four track machines and, and SPX 90s, multi effects units and synthesizers and computers in my, in my teens, you know. Yeah. So I was using the Atari computer and there was also a Yamaha computer, I had a DX7 and, and a, an RX21. So yeah. making music then and um jamming really actually and then kind of trying to uh, improvising but sort of trying to make a song as i went along yeah. and doing that on lots of different instruments at the same time so it was quite interesting not always successful but there were some good moments <laughs> but that had a kind of a direct <coughs> kind of relation to what to what we were trying to do with them um, yeah so so the yeah global community that so we were trying to do something similar you know back in 97 so you know 14 15 years later so that was and that has kind of led me down a back down a, a, a path of making music separately from from what i do on my nine to five you know so i spent a, a long time yeah rediscovering my love of electronics and synthesizers yeah. and tapes and um, all that kind of thing 
you sent me a track recently, which was, uh, was it Elgar? Uh, no, it wasn't. You sent me a, a link on Arvo Spotify. Part? No, it was some classical choir singing in church. Ah, oh, Rachmaninoff. Rachmaninoff, that was the one. It yeah. was the, the best. Um, not, I was going to say Lament, but it wasn't a Lament. It's, U, U it's, G for someone. It's a vigil. Is it the... Anyway, the, my, my point it's, was... It's an extraordinary piece of Rachmaninoff, yeah. yeah. Um, you saying you, your father was a church organist, you must have yeah. been surrounded by yeah. classical church music. Yeah, um, yeah. That yeah. being an example. Well, yeah, that's um, exactly, yeah. Is, is that an influence? You're saying you, 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 electronic music and mm. playing with prog bands, mm. but um, is, is that classical world an influence on... Massively so, yeah. and, and I realise that you know, more and more. Um, yeah, you know, I think vocal music, my dad's sort of... Uh, Love of, of vocal music is something that is 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 deeply imprinted on me. Yeah, uh, and the music of of Bach is, is you know as with all musicians should loom large in their life at some point because yeah. there's really some you know he pulls some amazing moves. Does our <laughs> does our Johann um, both spiritually and well, also you, mathematically? You, yeah, I was going to say as you were saying earlier about seeing the patterns in the music. Yeah, Bach's a prime. Prime place to start for that kind of business. Yeah, well, when I was taught, when I had to, we were taught how to uh, assemble Bach chorales yeah. when I was at college, and it's actually it's, it's purely math, mainly ninety eight percent of the time it's, it's mathematical. Yeah, there's, there's a system to it, but it's that little special two percent that he takes in in completely different places that make yeah. him the remarkable fellow that he was. Um, <laughs> so yeah, a vocal music is yeah, looms large. So I'm having a bit of a moment at the minute. I'm listening to lots of um, lots of vocal music. Arvo Part, uh, Rachmaninoff. I did. I've just discovered his uh, sacred vocal pieces, which are extraordinary. Um, and having some fun comparing and contrasting different recordings yeah. between uh, one one I'm listening to at the minute is a Bul- Bulgarian choir um, with a St. Petersburg orchestra and a, and a Russian conductor, and it's just uh, the Bulgarians and the Georgians are the places where. Uh, people have been singing for a long, long time. Yeah. And Georgia is where, what, f- I think the first recorded cases of polyphony yeah. are recorded. So It's a very close harmony. Yes. Uh, very like, clustered chords, all notes in the same octave. Yeah, lots of nice to kind of little um, things which, you know, I guess in sort of Western harmony or modern Western harmony, I might be wrong. But um, but they just, it's wonderful resonance mm. to it. Mm. So, um, yeah, that is, if you want to make me if you want to pacify me, no, no. Uh, just put <laughs> just put on some beautiful choral music. Yeah, and um, I'm your man. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that for later. <laughs> <laughs> we just load that one up. <laughs> <laughs> so, cracking on with the list of questions we have here, what myth about the music industry would you like to debunk? Oh, what myth about the music industry? Um. That I, well, I don't know if it's maybe a myth, but you know there isn't a, there isn't one route. There's not one size fits all. Yeah. And um, I think don't be afraid to follow your instincts, and um, and you know stand up for the things you believe in. Yeah. Uh, you just have to find the correct way, you know. And you've got to have so is a, there's a you know you've got to be sensible to a certain degree. You've got to learn to kind of spot opportunities, you know. Um, but also you've got to be honest and, you know, try and take your language with you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, be yourself. That's yeah. the important thing, isn't it? Yeah. Lots of right. That. Mm. Yeah, mm. not enough people do it, though. Yeah, in life. Yeah. Yeah, good. Not just in the music industry, for life. Yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. good way forward. Okay, so if you were to go back 20 years, mm-hmm. start again, mm. would you do anything differently? <laughs> I'd have probably bought a Fender Precision sooner. Ah. Uh, would I do anything different, uh, differently? Um, I am, um, uh, you know what? No, because even when I've been in situations where I maybe shouldn't have stayed in for such a long time, i.e. Jethro Tull, um, <laughs> you know, what happened after then and around that has fallen in a different way, you know. Mm. So um, I have a, I've, you know, have an interesting life. Yes. And um, I'm not afraid to say no, and I'm not afraid to kind of just, like, sit things out. I quite like the space, because, it, you know, I think the thing is, is having the chance to... Okay, this is related to the sleep question, you know, getting enough sleep, but create some space to think. 
because you can't run around like a headless chicken all the time no. because things don't get done properly yeah, exactly. and you end up becoming confused. Yes. Yeah, and it can happen surprisingly easily when you don't expect it as yeah, well. Yeah, sure. yeah. yeah. There's nothing, and you yeah, run the risk of burnout and, yeah, and you yeah. don't end up putting your all into the various projects because you're just spread too thin. That's right, you know. So I think, you know, uh, meditation is a, is a good thing. If you can do yeah. that to start a day, is a brilliant thing. And, um, you know, I try and get out around nature. Um, I'm, I'm all right in just taking a day off, you know. Yeah. I'm lucky enough to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. But um, I had a, I took a day off today. <laughs> Sun was out, so I went into London and took photographs. Very nice too. They're all blurred, but I'm very happy. <laughs> <laughs> they look like after the beers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. It's the head. <laughs> so if you wouldn't do anything differently, would you say your career would be one that you would advise someone to follow? I think there are things that I've, I think there's an approach that I've taken, which I think is still valuable. And I think that the big one being studying classical music, yeah. because it, I learned so much from doing that. I learned about, um, I discovered, even though, you know, music at home is classical music, but, you know, I learned about classical music history, studying that. Um, and I think it's a really solid, you know, it's, it's all, you know, it's all applicable, yeah. you know, to, all music. This is what you were saying earlier about um, there being a language amongst musicians as well, and being able yeah. to speak the language. Yeah, the words. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, and it, you know, so, sometimes it's not easy to find a common language, but um, if you're able to express yourself or explain what it is mm-hmm. you're trying to do, then yeah. um, that's that's a you know that's that's always a good thing. I think. I've, I've seen recently there's been. Several plugins come out one after another after another. It seems to be a trend of um, you see people in forums saying, You don't need to learn music theory, that's for nerds. Yeah. Load this plugin, and there's chord progressions listed by yeah. genre and mood or whatever. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I find just that just putting sounds together, which yeah. in some ways is a viable form of music and sampling and things like that. So, well, absolutely, you know, because you know, though, yeah, as we know, you know, we're able to look back and enjoy the music of Tricky and. And um, massive attack and stuff. We know that, that that's all good. Um, what was the question <laughs> about? Um, rather than you were saying about learning music theory, learning about classical music, oh yeah, yeah. piece together. Mm. You are saying learning that is, is was a valuable thing. No, it's you, it's, it's, it's it's fundamental. And also, there, there are people that are now using plugins to do that for them without having to have the understanding. Yeah, well, see, you know, I think that learning a language stays with you for life. Mm. I was watching somebody today talking about that, about how he was learning a piece of equipment and it was equated to him learning English, because I guess he's of Spanish origin. And um, I thought that was absolutely right. But yeah, you know, and and also, yeah, you know, it's the way that you internalise language and, you know, you can figure out, you can use that language to figure out problems. It gives you so many, it gives you so much, um, even though, even with basic information, really basic stuff, it can give you, uh, the, you know, everything's in the basics. Yeah. It gives you everything right there, be it, you know, a triad, a major triad or a minor triad or yeah. how a bass line works or, yeah. you know, how percussion works, all that kind of stuff. Would you say it opens up creativity? Yeah. Having that knowledge in the background so that you can actually not get blocked in a path because yeah. there's a certain amount of knowledge I have which stops. They were about learning something in the background of how I got to that stage and progress it, but I can't ever step forward. So. You just have to keep at it, I think. It does, you know, I think there's that, I remember there's quite a common question of people coming out of college and feel that they were kind of constrained by the amount of technical information that you learn, you know, and, yeah. I, and I heard there's a great quote by Charlie Parker, the, um, the jazz sax player, bebop guy, um, and he said, basically, you know, you, you just, you have to learn everything and then forget it. Right. And that's when you, I, that's when a different school comes and you've got to piece together in, you, in your own way. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, rules are, are, are great. And, you know, you, it's like you can't have, can't have math without equations, can you? Yeah, exactly. So sort of following on from that in a way, I suppose, do you dedicate any time or much time to practicing your scales and your modes and your licks? Yeah, I, I really kind of, the, the thing that I try and do every day is really kind of the, the, the simple stuff. Yeah. So I play, um, yeah, I play around with yeah scales, some modes, arpeggios, and those are uh, they're good for good for the ear. Um, but also, it's important to to keep, particularly my fretted hand, yeah. because on the guitar that's where most of the sound comes from. So trying to keep that in check. 
Um, but I also try and play a bit of Bach as much as I can because mm -hmm. that is a, well, you know, it's kind of transcendental, meditational yeah. as well. But um, I try and do that. Um, I try and do that as often as I can. <laughs> and then and then I faff around <laughs> or, you know. I remember um, Eric Roach saying, uh, I used to work for a chap called Eric Roach, yeah. and he said about practising just practicing up and down the neck, mm. doing exercises. Um, for him, the most important aspect of doing that was his fingers learnt where the notes were, yeah, where the yeah. sound of the notes were. Yeah. So then when he was improvising, he could go from brain to the guitar making the noise without having to think about yeah. where that was on the fretboard. See, that's the purpose, that's the purpose of, of uh, learning the language so that you can do that. Yeah. So that it becomes conversational, you know. And, um, yeah, because that's where the, you're doing things without thinking. That's where there's magic there. Yeah, I can, I can dig that. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, nice one, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, right, here we go. Recently, one of our students described the music industry mm. as being an old white men's club. Yeah. Um, and there was a conversation we had about diversity in the music industry yeah. um, and representation of genders and yeah. so on and so forth. I think um, certainly that the foundations of the industry are that, as is the corporate world. Mm. Um, things aren't anywhere near as austere as they used to be, yeah. thankfully. And in the last 20 years, there's, um, there's been a bit more kind of renegade action, much mm. more kind of street stuff. And, you know, we live in, in a world that thankfully is is enlightened to things and um this generation are the future and mm -hmm. you know i think with that attitude the, the future is bright i think there's a place for everybody there's never not going to be those people the Svengalis, and um and there is also there is some kind of mechanism at place you know in amongst all this the very very diverse way in which music is uh created and marketed and and such, but um, but I guess you know everybody's trying to do the same thing, which is to get people to listen to music, yeah. And that's the interesting challenge. So that's coming back to my point of finding your path. Yeah. That's what you've got to. That's the tricky thing, you know. That's a, it's a great challenge. Yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's um, yeah, I think I can't remember the statistic off the top of my head, mm. but women are hugely underrepresented. Yeah. In, in the art, the creative industries in general. Yeah, yeah. In the music industry, it seems more so. Yeah. Uh, the I times so. are definitely changing. Yeah. Things, things are afoot. So with, with that sort of diversification in mind, if you like, is how mm. do you think the music industry or the creative industry could be more opening and encouraging of that? Um, well. A bit of a big question, that one. Yeah. I, I would just, well, I don't know, you know, I, I'd say just people have to just carry on being open-minded yeah. and curious mm. and um, just that, you know, I think there's yeah. a place for everybody. Yeah, I think that the change is going to come as the new generations come in. Definitely. The, the, because the old, the old guard will fade away. Well, yeah, quite, you know, I think, you know, there's obviously kind of sections of the old guard that have picked up on the positive benefits of everybody being together and that's the whole point, you know. Mm. Um, but it's definitely in the hands of, of our kids yeah. and... Um, it's it's good, yeah. You know, uh, things. Nothing is set in stone. Yeah. And when it's time to change, it's time to change. Mm. And we're witnessing that right now. Well, that was a chunky question. That one, mm. <laughs> a tricky one. There. Yeah. Um. No, there's a question here that says, um, "What should we have asked you? <laughs> what should you? What should you have asked me? What should you have asked me? Hmm. That's a big one. Hmm." Okay, have that bubbling away in the back of your head. Yeah, yeah. Um, leave that, leave that, let that percolate for a little yeah, bit. Exactly. Um, have you got any three sort of desert island discs at the moment? We don't need to do the whole ten. But, no, okay. No, um, let's do three. Well, I'm having a bit of um, quite a serious Arvo part moment. So um, I think there's an album called Fratres, which is sort of, I guess probably 1987 or 88. And it's got some really key things on there. Yeah. But it's brilliant. It's just really, really brilliant. And he um, he's Estonian. He's still alive. He's mm -hmm. probably our greatest living composer on the planet, I'd say. Um, 
he grew up in uh, under Soviet rule mm -hmm. and uh, was he writing minimalist, uh, not minimalist, serialist music actually. So something which was, uh, uh, you know, had a more sort of, sort of the breaking down of harmony that happened in the kind of 20s. And um, it's that movement where you can rearrange notes in any old way, you know. You take the 12 tones of the scale mm -hmm. of, a, of an octave, that's the 12, that's 12 note serialism. So right. you, you create a theme based on um, a pattern. So there's a mathematical element to that. But he, um, he discovered um, sacred music and he discovered um, some very particular um, and rather unique, very simple and quite beautiful kind of harmonic devices. Mm -hmm. Um, which are kind of yeah unique to him. Um, so it's going back to kind of the question of you know, the relevance of understanding the technicalities of what you do. You know, there's a lot to be learned from his music as there is in Bach. There's lots mm -hmm. of numbers and movements and yeah, yeah. maths slowing things down, etc. So that record is um, really really high on my list. I've always got to say that the White Album by the Beatles is the thing. Mm. That's the, the thing, the greatest thing that in my life, it's, yeah. it's probably the greatest piece, body of piece of work there is, I think. So that record, I grew up listening to that, yeah. and um, I think it's extraordinary. Um, so is Rain, by the way, but um, by the Beatles. Um, third one, what would be the third one? Well, it would probably have to be something like, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking electronic. I really, 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 really love Aphex's Siri album. Is it Siri? Syro. 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 I think that's a f brilliant record. So with the green in the background. Yeah, I think that's a really, 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 really great, smart record. You know, somebody said, uh, When in Rainbows came out by Radiohead, yeah. I heard it said, and I agree with this, that it's sort of the, what's the, what's the great, what's the best, what's the best, you know, somebody asking a question at the time, what's the best Radiohead album to get? Well, the current one, because it's sort of the most radio-heady one, right. funnily enough. Apparently, it's a very difficult record to make for them. But it's a, you know, it's a really good taster of a slightly watered down, but quite brilliant, still brilliant, um, a kind of quite a cleaner version of Radiohead. I'd definitely say it's my favourite Radiohead album. Really? Yeah. yeah. Wow, yes. Well, that, yeah, that, that's a big question. Yeah. That's the question you should have asked. What's the best Radiohead <laughs> album? I'm going to answer that one yeah. in a minute. Um, <laughs> so there's that. Um, also, you know, I think John Hopkins Ooh. is, you can have a whole podcast about what I think he's trying to do, but I think he's very, very, very clever. He has had a classical training. Yeah. He's, he was a, a pianist. Mm. And he has taken his... A love and knowledge of music and done something quite extraordinary with it um, he's very 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 good with dynamics yeah. and I've not, on record but I went to see him play at the Royal Albert Hall for a couple of months ago and that was quite extraordinary so he's brilliant because he's tapping into something he's tapping into something um, sort of deeper he's, he's, he's tapping into something which is uh, kind of cerebral he's like mm. kind of playing with people something oh. like mind control uh, or hypnotism so yeah, but you know, sure, yeah, um, board, boards of Canada, you know, some boards of Canada records. Yeah, right, Manoff, Chopin. Um, yeah, anything. Yeah, lots of things. Lots of things. Yeah. I'm surprised you didn't say square pusher. Well, I, I was going to say feed me weird things, so I will. Feed me weird things <laughs> is an amazing record. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, really, really great. What's interesting you now they've just uh, re-released it on vinyl. Yeah. Of course, he's a, he's a 90s artist, as is Aphex, but I think uh, this is the, the first of his classic batch of albums that have been done for vinyl. Yeah. So has had a, he's had a, a lot of um, oversight of that project, so it's got some, got some nice insight into what, what he was doing, why he was doing it, and how he did it, yeah. which is quite brilliant. He's a square pusher, somebody that everybody needs to have a listen to. Square pusher and Aphex Twin are two peas but very, very different peas in the same pod. Yep, I completely and utterly agree with that. Mm -hmm. Go on then, John. What is your favourite Radiohead album and why? Well, well, here it is. <laughs> uh, the one that had the biggest effect on me was OK Computer. Yeah. Because I heard that when it came out and it just blew my mind. Uh, the Benz I really love. Yeah. 
because it's a guitar record. Yes. And uh, it's a really, really great record. And it sounds fantastic. Um, I like the kind of records, the interim records between, oh man, Kid A and Amnesiac. Kid A is amazing, man. That's an amazing record. That's probably the greatest record they've done. It's probably the greatest record they've done. Yeah. I think it's the most groundbreaking. It, uh, yeah, I'd say that. Yeah. But the ones that come after that are really, really great. Uh, but I, I love Moon Shape Pool. Mm. Man, yeah, I love that record. Have you seen the um, online exhibition they have? Ah, oh, it's recent, isn't it? Yeah. With Stanley Dunwood. Is it? It's all about the, the art. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, it's... It's a virtual art gallery that you can wander around oh, yeah, on okay. your computer. No, I didn't know. I mean, of course, that's the sort of thing that they can do. Mm. No, I haven't seen that. I was just going to look up the track listing for... Amnesia. Johnny Greenwood, right? There's somebody yeah. that studied classical music. Another one, yeah. Um, doesn't know any Deep Purple solos. Doesn't know the band. Great. Love that. Absolutely yeah. love that. Yeah, Absolutely yeah. love that. Ah, right. Okay, talking of Radiohead, I associate Radiohead with Nigel Godrich. Mm. Um, and I, I'm personally, I'm a big fan of producers that have a definite sonic fingerprint yeah, on yeah. the band they work Strong for. Strong ideas, yeah. When you're producing, because you sort of do some producing, mm. um, is that something you intentionally do? Or would you say it's a side effect? Or do you not have a sonic fingerprint? Well, no, I, I think I do, you know, because I think that part of when you're producing, at least the way, I mean, you know, you can, there's all sorts of different ways that you can produce. You can be a producer, you know, you can be an engineer producer, you can be somebody that writes string arrangements. Yeah. But what I tend to do, I have a little bit of an arsenal that I bring along and that tends to be a few set pieces that I know, bits of gear that I know, and I know that I can get different sorts of results uh, using those things. So I have a, I tend to carry a, a Moog, mm -hmm. a Space Echo, uh, my machine drum, uh, which is a, a sw electron machine drum, which is a, a Swedish-made drum machine, which is mm -hmm. fairly extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, it's quite remarkable, actually. <laughs> um, also samples in a very basic form. You can do some kind of wonderful kind of crunchy things with it. Um, and the other thing, I've got a Yamaha CS15D, which is really great for atmospheres and things so that's what i tend to that's what i tend to take uh i've got some other things that i kind of bring with me uh, but but i always bring my space echo i've got another analog echo by bug brand called the pt delay okay which is it's it's a bucket braid it's a it's a chip uh, yeah the bucket brigade was a, a chip that had lots and lots of capacitors on it That's yeah the, the original and each capacitor every time there's a clock cycle capacitor would pass its charge onto the next one yeah, yeah. like a bunch of guys passing buckets well you can hear that you know yeah, when you the, start the saying top things. end would disappear yeah so it, went, so it gets muddy as it goes and it's so a like, distinctive sound like tape you know tape, mm. tape to something similar would be different so you have one of those but yeah, that, that's, you know, mm. and a bass. Funny enough, when I'm producing, the bass is actually the, the thing I'm least bothered about. Right. So I tend to play completely differently on things that I produce for myself, which right. is quite interesting, actually, because there's, you know, I, 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 was figure, I was trying to figure it out, you know, why is it I play differently? I tend to play much simpler, yeah. in a much more kind of classic way, a bit more like Klaus Vormann on Imagine, for instance, you know, uh, who's very, very good at just playing the simplest thing going. Okay. He's amazing. Um, yeah, but when I'm playing bass for other people, I tend to, I don't know, maybe just have a bit more fun, maybe. Yeah. Uh, maybe. <laughs> or a different kind of fun. Well, seeing as we've started, we might as well carry on talking about gear. Yeah. Would you like to talk us through your, your, your bass rig? Gear, right, gear. Well, bass gear. There are, there are, there are kind of, I've got, I've, got, I've got some workhorse things, mm -hmm. right? But over the years, I've ended up, kind of dishing almost all of those and um, using things that I felt were more characterful. Yeah. And um, I really love the sound of an old Fender Precision, so I have one of those. And Flat wound on. They're half rounds, okay. actually, which is a halfway between a round wound and a, and a flat wound. It's a little bit brighter, and it has a slightly... It was a more unusual sound, actually. Um, I like it on those bases. Um, I've also got a 1961 Fender Jazz, which is sort of similar but different to the Precision. I love, that's those are the sounds I really, really love. I love that. Um, so those are kind of the things that I tend to take everywhere with me. I have a, a little collection of old wall bases which were made for me, which are wonderful things. The, the wall were, I guess, the, the English equivalent of Alembic, uh, born out of the music in the live music industry. A high end instrument. Yeah, it's a high-end, it's a properly kind of handmade 
well, that's a classic piece of kit. So I have some of those. I've got some, um, got Hofner bass. McCartney style. Which is a McCartney style thing, which is really great. I love that. Use that quite a lot. Just had a bass built for me, which is a bit like an, an old Gibson EB2 by John Case, um, which I'm taking. semi hollow body. Yeah, yeah. Fretless basses, some acoustic things. Uh, but the, the things that I kind of, the first really good instrument I had was the Yamaha bass. And uh, that bass is still my favorite bass. And it's only like, a, it was sort of made in, it was a made in Korea, uh, made in Taiwan. And my 17th birthday present, it's a BB-1100S. And it's a, it's such a great bass, yeah. you know. Yamaha is such an interesting <laughs> company because they really, th- you know, I think the thing about it is they, it's, there's something very human about what they, what they, um, their best things and they do they get things right they they, they sort of the sort of the, the way that you interact with those things is works in a really really nice way but they've done something really smart with that bass because i realized that i used to cut my first professional recording sessions using that bass and i used to plug my bass back in the day i used to plug my bass straight into the desk yeah and it sounded killer and i mean that like which is exactly what nile rogers did right. and bernard edwards of chic they used to plug their things so you get a very a very direct sound, you know. The instrument works in a slightly different way. And it's nice. It's really, really direct. There's no amp, no, you know, you just got the board. It's great, exactly. you know, so you can have some fun with the, you know, with your Neve channel, whatever. <laughs> um, so that was really, really, yeah. So um, I've got a, another instrument which they've made quite recently called the BBP34, which is an amazing bass. It's handmade and it's just, it's like their version of a, of a Fender but it's kind of got its own thing and it's just a, such a good instrument. I can't believe it. Um, I want to get a five string version of that because I've got a plan and it will sound <laughs> really, really, really great. Okay. So that's kind of what goes on with those. And then I've got, um, I've got some old amplifiers for recording. I've got an Ampeg B15, which is a classic kind oh, of sixties flip top, um, bass amplifier. Um, I've got a Wallace amplifier, which is, built by Ted Wallace who built amplifiers um, I guess he was building during the war mm-hmm. he was a military man and built amplifiers for the, all the studio guys in London and um, I inherited mine from my double bass teacher Jeff Klein wow. so it's got well, I think he also inherited it from Lenny Bush as well so it's got some heritage to it but it's a really brilliant 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 amplifier um, so I've got that I've got some big old SWR stuff, which is what I use live. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't make it any longer, but it's really, really solid. And um, the cabinets are great. So mm-hmm. I've actually got about three or four different rigs yeah. of, uh, of those things. Okay. And I have a, yeah, I had... Is that how you pronounce it? Squid Scrub, I think. Yeah. Um, I've found it necessary to have a proper preamp <laughs> for doing big gigs because you have to have a your interface is everything when it comes to everything but uh with a bass um it's a question of getting you've got uh, a good bit bit of science like a proper preamp it it um it hits home quickly you know it fits so big big room still that stuff (laughs) stuff. it's not all at home you know there's two different places in london outside of my studio where it lies you know <laughs> yeah but i'll keep all the good stuff with me if all the big stuff stays out yeah but it's wicked um i did um i did some shows with Milan farmer who is a french phenomenon and um I we know about those those were big shows they were very big shows um she when she goes out she goes out and she does it properly and she's a huge star so we were playing a run of shows at um, in Paris at a place called the U Arena, which is, the, I think, the largest indoor arena in, in Europe. Right. And full capacity is something like 44,000 people. And we were, the production was very, very big. So I think we, tickets, was, it was about 25,000 a night. We did, I don't know, 11 nights there. So it was important that I had a, a completely reliable and excellent amplifier and yeah. setup. So that's why I bought the Squid Strip because that's got a few key um, studio components in a in a in a box that works for live. Yeah. So that's really where you get the focus. And what was amazing about that gig 
uh, was that they ran my rig flat out front, so there was, they didn't add any compression or EQ. They were running it the way I set up. So I've got quite. I have a also have a pedal board, and there's a, there's actually quite a lot of refining that goes on there as well. Yeah. So between that and then it goes into the preamp, and then it goes out front. Yeah. Um, it does sound really clean. Yeah. 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 You have a big trees on there, is that? A big trees preamp, which is a valve preamp, which focuses things in a really nice way. You can also drive it, so which is nice color actually you can't you don't often kind of really notice it the way i use it but because it's very subtle but it just kind of warms things up a little bit for some things sometimes you want a little bit direct um so i have the direct sound but so when i want something's a little bit more uh fuzzy then i put the other channel on yeah so that's key yeah. i've got a thing uh called a bass switch by um rmi um and that's kind of the hub where all the the guitars and the tuners and the pedals go into that yeah. and um that has some eq on it as well it's a really an amazing little box i have to say yeah. the eq on it is extraordinary all the components are a top dollar it's really 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 yeah. brilliantly designed so that that kind of that's the start of the process and then it goes into the uh, audio kitchen stuff and then um, to the preamp yeah so there's yeah. like three or four different things going You're on a there fan of an oc2 as well Yes, I've had an OC2 uh, modded for me, yeah. Um, Pete Cornish, who is the the, the guy, yeah. the, the switching guy, he's responsible for building, he's one of the people that built rock and roll, you know. Yeah. You've got, um, you know, he he used to, he started out making guitar cables in the 60s. And... Um, People started doing tours and he started being asked to put things together and the tours got bigger, so they needed to be more sturdy and they needed to be, oh, this is buzzing. Why is that buzzing? So yeah. Pete got his head, his he was head. Vertical. Yeah, he got all that kind of sorted out. So he he modded my OC2, so I'm able to... It has three elements to the sound. You've got the direct signal that's out of the, of the bass and then an octave down and then two octaves down. And the octave down is a square wave the second octave down is somewhere between a square and a sine wave and um we don't know why uh, so it's uh, we had a sort of curious conversation uh, pete was very curious about that and me too actually i think that the uh second octave down is a pure sine wave um thinking about it but anyway it just gives me the way we've set it up we've got a switch for all of the um, the octaves so i can i can turn off the direct signal with a with a with a switch as opposed to bending it down on the floor and turning a knob right so i've got individual control over uh switching for all the octaves that's yeah. um that makes life much I can imagine, easier I can imagine for the average bass player having mm. two octaves down mm. being potentially overkill and the hell would I want that? I'm playing a bass anyway. Yeah. But then when you're playing this, the scale of the shows that you're playing and the mm. size of the PA systems, that, yeah. that is reproduced, those super low frequencies. Yeah, you know, it works. It does work. But also, you know, it, it's also for texture as well. You, you have to know w w what you're doing with it. You can make it sound small, you know. Mm. If you stick enough distortion on something, it will kind of, it'll make it, it'll sort of compress it a bit. Yeah. So, um, but it, yeah, working with a big system is a, is a joy, you know. Yeah. Another texture to play with. Well, yeah, and particularly when we're doing when you're working with synths, you know, synths and electronics. Um, yeah, things tend to be quite bold, production-wise these yeah. days. They're quite rich. Yeah. You know, maybe a bit too so, but it does mean that um, it's an opportunity to, to step up and um, explore mm. without actually getting the moog out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Cool. Well, yeah, jumping back to our list of questions, because yeah. why not? Yeah. Um, you being a bass player, mm. is there any particular bass player you think our students should check out? <sighs> yeah. You can say uh, no, I'm not. No? No, no, I'm not. Uh, there's a few different people. McCartney, number one. Always yeah. McCartney is the guy, man. Uh, he's a genius. Um, he makes everything look so easy yeah. because he's so what he's brilliant at he's so hip to the you know you've just got to be in the moment all the time yeah. 
Yeah. And there's nothing, there's no do it later, it's do it now. Mm-hmm. That's the way he operates and he always does that. So that's why he makes things look really easy. But it ain't easy, man. So he's a genius. Um, so, yeah, check out Rain by the Beatles and check out Paperback Writer and um, the Magical Mystery Tour album. It's one with Penny Lane on it, isn't it? Yeah. yeah that's Ooh. a juicy piece of music. That yeah, one. that's wonderful. Uh, there's a fellow called Jimmy Johnson, who is an American guy, and I've heard him. He's famous for playing with, who's the really... He was signed to Apple in the late 60s. I can't remember the name of the guy. Anyhow. um, We'll check him out. Yes. He's great, great guys. Um, But I've also heard him do things with Ellen Holdsworth, and he's just as absolutely amazing. I think he's so brilliant because he's a very, very lyrical player. And um, it's, I guess, you know, what he's doing in... So the Ellen Holdsworth album called, called Sand, and there's, you know, there's lots of stuff going on. You know, Ellen Holdsworth is an amazing mel- you know, melodic musician and Gary Husband in the background playing some incredible drums and, and some kind of synth textures. And the thing that glues it all together is Jimmy. And he's kin. He's, he's, what he's doing is, is, is a bit like kind of walking bass. You know, he's just creating something for people to kind of latch onto. But he does it in such a... A lyrical way it's just absolutely incredible he's got an incredible tone as well mm-hmm. but he's wonderful he's really really brilliant so there's um and so i guess similarly is larry klein mm-hmm. who um, is a wonderful bass player and producer and arranger and appears on some peter gaber albums john giblin right. john giblin is absolutely worth a mention he is um he's a great fretless player but he's famous for playing and all sorts of stuff, but including um, Kate Bush's material. Right. He's a wonderful player. Mm-hmm. He's really, really great, man. He just goes so deep. Yeah. Um, Eberhard Weber, right. who's more of a sort of classic, classical European, classical kind of jazz, but he used uh, an electric double bass and used to do things with loops and stuff. You also hear, hear him on, um, on some Kate Bush records. Um, and there is um, Mick Khan, mm-hmm. amazing fretless player from Japan, uh, really out there on his own. Um, Larry Graham, <laughs> the other end of the spectrum. Okay. Prince, man. Prince. Prince, oh, yeah. man. Prince looms probably larger than Radiohead in my life, or as large as yeah? Radiohead, yeah. So Prince was an amazing bass player. Yeah. Um, band. He was an amazing everything player. Yeah, he was extraordinary. God, man. Yeah, it's just really incredible. Um, yeah, yeah. Victor Bailey. Who's that? Victor Bailey is the guy that joined Weather Report after Jacko. Right. And he's amazing. Big boots to fill. Big boots. Yeah. And, you know, difficult job being in Weather Report, anyhow, without any of that kind of crap going on. Yeah. But my goodness, following Jacko, what the hell? But Victor has had so much of his own stuff going on. Mm-hmm. And it was something. Really, he was really street, you know. He was he was really hip, but yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Really wonderful player. Um, so yeah, he's I really he's he he gets a big thumbs up from me. Um, cool. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> groovy. Yeah, I'll definitely check some of those out. Yes, as many of them as I can remember. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we're coming up for probably some time. So a couple of last questions. Yeah. Wicked. What do you see the future of music being? Or the music industry or just, you know, in general? What's going to happen? Well, I don't know. People still want to see gigs, don't they? Yeah. I think that's never going to change. Um, How about the way that people experience music? I don't know, but it's sort of, you know, people experience music in a slightly different way, I'd say. But... um, I suppose on the technological side, there's the whole Atmos and the whole... Immersive yeah. video thing happening. Yes, those things are very interesting. Um, you know, there's a TikTok element to things, you know, it's a TikTok um, uh, influence on the way that kind of some music is made, that's for sure. You know what, it's just, it's going it's, it, to, it, you know, you can't really change that much. I think there are some, maybe some things with delivery and the, the way that, that, that people interact with technology and music that, uh, on a domestic level that might change but I think that uh, people want to hear music 
and um, you know, there's broad scope for all sorts of stuff. Yeah. People want to go and see gigs as well. Gigs is maybe it's where gigs will change. Maybe because things have changed a lot. See, I asked them um, since the you know, mm. front of the house, Philippe. Um, asked him the same question. Yeah, and he was saying he engineers big stadium shows. And he was saying it's going to be less and less when you go to a gig about having a big PA system and having lots of little really putting sound in places. That's interesting. Yeah, so that's that's amazing. Change experience. Yeah, that's kind of quite avant-garde, isn't it? Yeah. Quite like that. Yeah, I think the 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 live music thing will continue to evolve. You know, it's really interesting when you see the people doing the really really big shows that are interested in stuff and they've got the budget to try out ideas because those are actually very very innovative things. Yes. The Muse shows and the radio heads yeah. are always kind of got some good stuff going on. Yeah, that's an old tradition as well. I mean, the Grateful Dead with their wall of yeah many speaker systems. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, Alembic came out of all that culture. You know, yeah. it's very interesting. But yeah, that's uh, you know, that's the, these are the people that, like I say, built built rock and roll because it was necessary. Mm. Things had to change. They didn't have big enough PA. Didn't they, they needed better PAs? Yeah. You know, um, and then all the other stuff that comes with that: better mm. amplifiers and louder things and more focus. And mm. you know, cool. We have one last question, John. We asked you about three desert island discs. Mm. So out of all of your equipment. Mm. Three Desert Island pieces of equipment. My Moog. Which is a Voyager, is it not? It's a Moog Voyager, yeah. Um, I bought that in 2003. I've done all sorts of stuff. I never thought that I'd sort of have some kind of a side career as a Moogist. But it turns <laughs> out... Moogist? Yeah. Is that a thing? <laughs> yeah. I've become a Moogist, which I, I love it. I love the Moog. It's such a brilliant, it's such a brilliant instrument. You know, and the reason why it's so successful is that, that everything's in front of you. Or, this, or, or exactly what you need is right there in front of you. You yeah, can yeah. play a note, and then you can you can fiddle with it. And that's the genius of the of the Moog, of the mini Moog. Um, it sounds killer. I love it. Um, very very creative tool. I just um, it's just magnificent. So there's that. Uh, well, there'd have to be a bass in there, wouldn't there? Yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> difficult. So I really loved. Yeah, I, I have two old Fenders. And um, the Fender Jazz is a 61, and that's more, I bought that more recently, and that's just absolutely wonderful. It's wonderful. Yeah. I love it. I love it. It's so, it sounds so rich and fat. I love, I love that bass. But probably my 1960 Precision is the, is, is, the, is the instrument because that just changed my whole life yeah. when I found that instrument. That changed my whole understanding of how bass could sound and B, you know, I've used that on so many different things. I've used that with Gary Moore. Yeah. I've used it with Archive. Yeah. I've used it in traditional kind of rock and roll settings and blues settings, and I've used it in electronic settings and on um, on soundtracks for films. You know, going back to the discussion earlier about films, the thing of that you know, the thing about that is texture. So having an instrument like that, it sits in a different way yeah. from like a, a normal Fender Jazz would. Um, so that's part of that arsenal. So there's that and there's that. And wow, what would my third piece be? It could be, could be a drum machine. It's probably my, it's my machine drum. Yeah. My electron machine drum. Yeah. I love it. Make uh, quite a racket with those bunch of instruments as well. Yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have to say there's an amazing little thing by... Teenage Engineering, which is based on the Microtonic drum machine. It's a little a thing that's like the size of a calculator, and they've ported the sounds of an app onto this chip. Right. So it does, you know, fifty percent of, of what the app does, and it's it's uh, it's, by, it's by Sonic Charge the app. Sonic Charge, the Swedish company. Um, it's called the Microtonic. It's the best. It's the greatest drum machine of all time. Mm -hmm. I would take that with me. That's what I'm going to take. Yeah, yeah because it's it's an analog, uh, virtual analog drum machine, but it sounds so killing. Uh, the sounds of it, uh, all like single oscillator um, voices, you know. Yeah. So very basic. I've, I've used it for doing creating like bass sounds and stuff. Mm -hmm. They can do weird stuff in it. Um, but it also it swings in a really great way. Yeah. Um, 
Daft Punk used on a few things. Yeah. Um, but yeah. There's but, something very particular about the swing on drum machines. Yes, the way that the way they all sit in different ways. I had a big argument with a friend of mine, keyboard player friend, because he, he said it was a load of old hokum. And I said, no, it ain't, mate. And um, there's just a couple of different things going on, actually. Yeah. It's, um, it's the way they clock. Right. And Roger Lynn is very good at that. That's one of the things that he understood. He's a very interesting fellow. Yeah. Um, when he made the Lindrum, it, was, uh, it, does, it has some nuances that make it um, sound like it does, yeah. which we've, become, we've come to appreciate. Um, there's that. The other side of it is the, um, is the, the output amps. Right. So the way the, all the, the preamps that are in there, yeah. uh, which color things in a way, you know, like the you know, SP12s. And also you've got bit reduction as well with those sorts of things. But with the MPC 3000, you know, that has a very particular thing. That's partly down to the um the preamp or whatever the output yeah. would, would, would. Well. yeah exactly yeah. yeah so but yeah that, that's you know I, I love drum machines for that because there's a whole world of yeah, character there about swing on them mm. my understanding of it was like, back in the day there was the Yamaha swing and the Korg swing yeah which is like your, your one two three four in a bar yeah. one of them would drag them that way and the other one would drag them that way yeah yeah different Sweet, they do it in different ways. Yeah, right. Um, and then Lynn, Roger Lynn, when he made that machine, it, it does, that's like a central point. You can swing balls. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's moving those two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he, he clocked that. He's a very, he's a, because he started out as a, well, he's, he's another one of these guys who's a, he's a musician and an electronics guy. And he was a session musician in LA, so he's used to, you know, the world of music and the, the uh, idiosyncratic ways that drummers have in playing their instrument. <laughs> so, but he, he clocked, but I think the thing is he clocked what it sort of gives the illusion of something feeling yeah. a certain way. And uh, he did that. He had his own way of doing it, put it that way. And that Lindrum snare sound is the sound of Prince. It you is. Prince was a master of the Lindrum. Mm. Yeah, when doves cry. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for spending some time with us this evening John my pleasure Tim where can our listeners see you next uh, you can see me next somewhere you will see me probably on the continent with the archive in the fall um, you will probably see me on hear me on some films so ah yeah it's a Disney film coming out called Bad Guys or Bad Guy Bad Guys and I've done the bass on that so that's where you can hear some of my work Wonderful stuff, John. Thank you very much. God bless. Okay. Goodbye. Hey,